Grab your Bibles with me, if you will, Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. We have been here at Triumph in a series that we are concluding today. And this series is called Red Letter Day, and we're taking a look at the last sayings of Jesus on the cross. The last few things that he said, and the reason they're so important is because when Jesus was hanging on the cross, the way that the Romans crucified you, uh, with your arms stretched up uh, above your shoulders, it actually caused your lungs to compress, and the only way you could take a breath, the only way you could speak a word, was to actually lift yourself up on the nails in your feet and the nails in your hand, and you had to lift your shoulders above your hands so that your lungs would function and you could take a breath. Well, you can imagine if you're Jesus and your back has been ripped to shreds by the cat of nine tails and every time you raise yourself up, not only are you expending energy that you don't really have, not only are you trying to use muscles and tendons that have been torn, but you're also rubbing your open wounds on the cross every time to take a breath. You wouldn't want to do a whole lot of talking. And yet Jesus makes several statements that are so powerful and life-changing. If you haven't been a part of this series, I would encourage you to get on our Triumph Church app, and you can go back and, and keep up and, and catch up. And um, as you just as we look at what Jesus did for us, what He said changed the world forever. But today we're gonna we're gonna talk about a few words. So the, some of the last words that He said. We'll pick up in verse thirty-two. I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. If you're there with me, say Amen. That was weak. If you're reading on the screen, say amen. amen. That's what I thought. Okay. <laughs> Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they had came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothing by throwing dice. The crowds watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he is really God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign fastened above him with these words, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to, to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. And then he turned to Jesus. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked at the man with, a, with all the love of our glorious Savior, and he replies, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. What powerful words that Jesus speaks to, to this criminal other versions use the word robber. The word uh, in the Greek, the, the word robber in the Greek refers to not just someone who, who uh, had a theft or a robbery, but who did it with violence and he did it openly. So if you can imagine, and imagine someone walking into your home and robbing you, but doing it in a very violent way, not trying to hide it. That's what these two men were. They weren't just criminals, but they were violent criminals. And in those days, the Roman government had sentenced them to crucifixion. And Jesus looks at the man and says, today you will be with me in paradise. What incredible words, what hope-filled words for all of us. If he could save the criminal dying on the cross, what could he do for you and I? They took Jesus to a place called the skull. And 
I had the opportunity to go to Jerusalem just a couple of weeks ago. There is a church there. Uh, you can take that down for me for just one second, guys. There is a church there. Uh, it's a Catholic church called the Church of the Holy Scepter. And in Catholicism, it is believed that this is the place where Jesus was crucified. That is the place of the skull. But historians don't really agree with that. Here's how that story happened. Here's how it ended up believing there. After Jesus dies and is, is resurrected, the church begins to grow. It, get, it begins to expand. Eventually, the church in Rome begins. And, and about three or four centuries later, in the fourth century A.D., uh, a Roman emperor by the name of Constantine. How many of you have ever heard of Constantine? Constantine was a very important figure in the history of the world because somehow God touched his life and he changed from his pagan religions and became a Christian. So he made the, the uh, national religion of all of Rome or all of the Roman Empire Christianity. It's why we call the Catholic Church the Roman Catholic Church. The next thing he does is he goes to his mother, he goes to his queen mother and he says, look, I want you to go to Israel and I want you to find all of the holy sites. Find where Jesus did certain things. Find where he was born. Find where he died. Find all these places and I want you to buy them up and the, and the government is going to own them. The, the church, the, 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 the Roman Catholic Church, which was the church of the government, is going to own them forever so no one can destroy them and no one can build on them. So the queen does that. She goes traveling throughout all of Israel and she's looking for holy places, places where something significant took place. She would find the place, buy it, and they would build a church there. Now I'm grateful for this. It's because of this that we know where a lot of things happen. But if you can imagine, you're a Jewish person, uh, you don't really believe in Jesus anyway, and you are uh, the lowest of the low in Roman society, you feel like more of a slave than a citizen, you don't like the Roman government, but all of a sudden the queen comes through with a blank check, open pocketbooks. And you are broke as broke can get, and you want to know, and she's asking you where something happened. All of a sudden, your little plot of land was some, where something very important happened. Can, can you see that taking place? Like, oh yeah, Jesus did this right here. Oh man, I'm telling you, this is the place of the skull in my backyard. I've known it forever. I've been holding on to it because I love Jesus so much. How much do you want to buy it from me for? Because she was writing checks that could change people's lives forever. Now, I don't know for sure. I'm not an expert. I don't know if the Church of the Holy Scepter is the place or not the place. I, I tend to believe uh, with most modern scholars today that it is not the place, but I may be totally wrong. However, I, I had the opportunity to go to uh, another location where more people believe is actually the place of the skull. And a man named Gordon was sitting in 1900. He was eating breakfast at a friend's house. Uh, in Jerusalem, and as he's praying and, and having a light breakfast, he looks across the way and he sees this picture in his prayer time. And he sees this mountain, and you can put the picture up for me now. He sees this mountain and he says, You know what? That kind of looks like a skull. So I don't know, did my green circle leave? There it is. So if you can see where this green circle is, if you, if you were looking there, does that look a little bit like a skull to you? You see the eyes, you see the nose, you kind of see a chin protruding from that. This is what he said. So he begins to ex excavate. He begins to look around. He actually finds a tomb, which would be, if you can see over on the left there, there's kind of a wall. Down in behind that, at the base of the mountain, there's a tomb. As they uncover it, as they pull out uh, the, the, all, all this stuff, and the Muslims have used it as a, as a literally a place to collect trash. And so he gets all of the trash out. He gets down to this tomb and he finds markings on the wall from the second and third and fourth century that declare, and they say that Jesus the Christ was laid here. And so now we believe that the garden tomb was just to the left of this. And many are convinced that because the tomb was there, this place looks like a skull, that this is the place that Jesus was actually crucified. Now, if you've been in church a long time and you are a fan of the hymnals, uh, you might remember the, the song, 
the old rugged cross, cross, right? On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. Wrong key. I don't sing. But the truth is, Jesus was never crucified on a hill far away. Whether or not this was the exact place, it wasn't a hill. He wasn't crucified on the top of the mountain. He was actually crucified lower. You see where these camels are walking right here? This is a primary road in and out of Jerusalem. And this is one of the places where they would crucify people. They would crucify them right beside the road so that everyone that came into town, remember that Roman crucifixions were as much about making a statement as they were about punishing the criminal. And so they would put them right beside the road where everyone had to walk. Jesus would have been crucified somewhere just like this with two criminals on his left and his right. But what I love about Jesus, whether he was crucified here or at the base of another hill or beside another road, he looks at these criminals. The Bible teaches us that early on, uh, according to Matthew, early on, both criminals were mocking Jesus. Both of these men were making fun of Jesus. But one of them has a change of heart. And he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And these loving words of our Savior, today you will be with me in paradise. Let's pray before we begin. Jesus, I thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us, giving the opportunity to live with you in eternity. Be with us today, Lord, as we preach your word, as we preach Christ and Christ crucified, just as Paul instructed us to do. Lord, I pray that your presence would be among us, that your Holy Spirit would do his work. Touch our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. 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 I want to ask you a question today, and I, I want to get everyone to participate with me in this. And so if, if you're a little shy or a little new, uh, you know, do it anyway, just because I asked and, uh, and, and I'm a nice guy most of the time. But if I were to ask you on a scale of 1 to 100, 1 being the worst of the worst and 100 being perfect, if I were to ask you how good of a person are you, what number would you give yourself? You don't have to say it out loud, but, if, but what number would you give yourself? Think on it for a minute. Look about, think about your life. Uh, you know, uh, the, the lower digits, it's, it's, it's men like Hitler. It's like an axe murderer. It's people with five or more cats. I mean, the lowest of the, lowest of the low. <laughs> Any cat people in the room? I'm sorry. I don't know. Um, on the higher end, you've got people, you know, Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, just like these, these icons of history. What would your number be? Now, do this with me. Look at the person next to you and say, how'd you do? What was your number? <laughs> Are they looking back at you a little crazy? Are you defending your number right now? You're like, no, I'm telling you, I'm a 43. All right, all right, let's do this. Let's do this. Have a little fun for a second. It's, it's, it's going to be okay. Lighten the mood just a little bit. Um, I'm going to get you this by show of hands. How many of you gave yourself between a 1 and a 30? A couple of you. Okay, hold them up high. It's good. Hold them up high. Real high, real high, real high. Security, we're going to have to take these people out right here. <laughs> all right, how many of you gave yourself between a 30 and a 50? Hold your hands up real high. Okay, okay, hold your hands up real high. Real high, I just want to say thank you to you because you are the reason there's a top half of this category. I, and I just want to say thank you because we make us that are above 50 feel better. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right. How many of you are between 50 uh, and let's say 70? Right in there. How many of you? Some of you? You're pretty good people. You're, you're pretty good people. Yeah? Yeah, you're looking around. Your spouse is looking at you. You liar. Like, I, I, know, I know, you're not, you're, not, you're not fooling anything. Jesus knows. Some of you are like scooting over a little bit. When you get struck with lightning, it's not going to hit me. Okay, how many you gave yourself between an 80 and a 100? Oh, man. Yeah, let me just say, we hate you. We don't like you at all. You are the people that have been driving us crazy all of our lives. Every time we got in trouble, you were Mr. or Mrs. Perfect. You never, we do not like you. But we're glad you're here.
What is your, what is your number B. I was considering this uh, not just for what you might put, but I was wondering what would happen if we went out into our community and asked people what number they would put down, just to kind of get a feel. So I sent my team out. Do you want to hear what they got in response? Yeah. All right, roll the video, guys. Question. I'm going to give you the mic. It is just on a scale of 1 to 100, if 1 being the absolute worst person who ever lived, and 100 Question. being I'm just absolute mic, perfection, just what number would you one give yourself? If one being the absolute worst person 50. who ever lived, 50? 100 being just absolute uh, perfection, 75. what number 75. would you give yourself? All right, let's just stop it. 30? All right, 30. What do we got? 50? 50 for no, you? stop it. We'll why, just why would you skip give yourself that? 50? 75. I guess because I got my good side. <laughs> 30? We did pray for our right, technology 30. to go well today. <laughs> Everybody has a little bit. Okay. For you? Uh, sometimes why, the Lord why would you answers your prayers 50? and sometimes he does not. I guess because I got my good side. No, it's okay. We'll skip it. Let's just say this. It's always interesting. What do you think would get your number higher? Where we rank. Because you know what we're doing? We're trying to compare ourselves. You can take it off screen, guys. We're comparing ourselves to other people. I don't know. Why We're looking around, and at first you're like, I don't like know. But then you see somebody else say 50, and you're like, oh, I'm better than that person. <laughs> All right? Um, because when, we, when we're comparing ourselves to other people, one of two things happen. When you hear their number and you know your number, if, if they give a lower number than you do, you start to feel better about yourself. You're like, man, I'm not such a bad person after all. I'm doing pretty good. Look, at, did y'all see how many said they were between a 1 and a 30? I'm doing great. I'm a 43. I am killing it in life. You start to feel better about yourselves, about your choices. But on the other hand, if you looked around and you saw all those 80s to 100s, and you're like, man, I, I started to feel worse about myself. Maybe I'm not what I thought I was. Maybe I'm not doing very well. I'm, I'm pretty bad. You, you, we start looking at them. We're like, you know, I, you know I, I don't cuss quite like they do. I don't lie and cheat like they do. I, I paid my taxes this year. I, I go to church more than them. I even give money every now and then to help out. I'm not too bad. But then there are people that they're just so great. They make us all feel a little inadequate. Ladies, you know the super mom? The one who always seems to have it together. She never misses anything that her kids are at. And she always has the perfect messy bun as if she didn't try, but you know she did. Her house is clean. She's always cooking. She never lets her kids eat fast food. Do y'all know the lady? Some of you are like, Pastor Randy, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> You know you're supposed to love her because she's so nice, but secretly, she makes you feel terrible about yourself. Or how about this? How about the super Christian? You know, we're just trying to be sincere followers of Jesus. I'm just trying to get up every day and make it through the day without losing my salvation on my kids. That's really my primary goal in life. But this, I, I never seem to get it right, but this person, like, they walk in the room and the angels start singing from the heavens. Anytime something happens, they've got a scripture for that. How do they memorize? Who has time to memorize all that scripture? And when they pray, do you ever listen to people pray and you're like, man, I'm never praying again. If, if I were God, I would answer that prayer immediately. That was beautiful. They speak in like King James, James language. They have THs on the end of everything. When they say the Father God, they say it with a little, the Father God. And, and you're just like, wow. I don't even know if I'm qualified to be a Christian around this guy. There, there are people in our lives that don't make us feel better about themselves. They're not trying. They just make us maybe feel like we're not as good as we should be. But here's the thing. We're not supposed to compare ourselves to each other. One writer said it like this, beware the disease of comparisonism. Because when we start comparing to each other, we think we can be doing worse, or we might be thinking we are doing well when all along we are comparing ourselves to the wrong standard. The truth is, the standard is not the person sitting next to you. However great they may be, or terrible may, they may be, they are not the goal. God's Word is the goal, or God's Word made incarnate by the name of Jesus Christ. That is the standard, that is the goal. So I'm not trying to compare myself to you. 
And I'm not kind of trying to compare myself to the worst person I know. I'm trying to compare myself to Jesus. Here's Jesus, and he's, he's hanging on the cross. And the world is comparing him to two criminals. The world is is seeing him up there and he's just as bloody, just as guilty, just as bruised and torn. He is is hanging there with these two guilty, violent criminals. And yet, he had never committed a sin. He had never done anything wrong. As crazy as it is to imagine this, this story illustrates one of the most important truths in our lives, and it corrects one of the biggest misunderstandings in our world today. You see, we think as Americans that good people or nice people go to heaven. But where's the line? Where's the line? If you're a good person, where is the line? Or is it, well, I'm a 20? Is it I'm a 50? Is it I'm a 60? Where is the line? Or the, the better question is, do I get like a mulligan on some things I did, Jesus? Can I get like a mulligan on all of my 20s? How many of you need a mulligan on your 20s, your college years? No, here's the truth. Good people do not go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Two criminals approach Jesus. They see his suffering. They see his pain. They see everything he's going through. And they're going through the very same thing. They are suffering. And in the beginning of the story, both of them are are mocking Jesus from their guilt, from their pain, from their suffering. They're still mocking Jesus. But one of them has a change of heart. The first criminal, though, he does not. He says in Luke 23, verse 39, prove it by saving yourself and us too. If you are the son of God, and he's continuing to mock Jesus. Because here's the truth. This man did not recognize Jesus for who he was. He was suffering. He was in pain. And all he was looking for from Jesus was a possible power that could end his suffering. All he's looking for is somebody to make his life easier, to make the pain stop. You see, every single one of us are one of these two criminals on the cross. And we are seeing Jesus. And when we see Jesus and we understand what he did with us, we have to have a response. As we go through suffering, as we go through difficulty, as we go through pain in your life, and I don't know where you are. Maybe you're struggling in your marriage. Maybe you're dealing with your teenagers. Maybe you're dealing with the loss of a loved one. Maybe you're fighting your finances. You're needing a job. Maybe you're struggling with sickness in your body. Whatever the case might be, as we are going through difficulties, when we approach Jesus, are we looking at Jesus as just a way to ease our pain and ease our suffering and help our life, but not really to be our Savior, not really to be our Lord, not really to be our friend? Are we looking for Jesus as an easy button? You remember those commercials? I believe it was Staples that had the easy button, the big red easy button, and they would just hit it and everything would be okay. So many people approach Jesus just that way. Jesus, if, if, if you are the Son of God, I really don't care. I'm just looking for someone to make my life easier. You see, our suffering interrupts our private goals, our pursuits, and our pleasures. So we need a Savior not to save us, just to help our problems so that we can go back to living life the way we want to. Jesus is not an easy button. He is not a simple means of escape from the pressures of our life. But I do want to tell you this. If you came in here and you are suffering today, there is good news. That if you will come to Jesus, if you will follow Jesus, if you desire a real relationship with him, the the Bible tells us that we can cast our cares on Jesus for he cares for us. Here's what else Jesus said. He said, come to me, all of you who are heavy laden, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said, I will give you rest. If you came in need of help today. You came to the right place. But that can't be the only reason we come to Jesus. You see, the second criminal, the one who is forgiven, I'll I'll say it to you like this, the forgiven one recognizes his own guilt. He realizes that I am wrong. He realizes that I have a problem. I am in need of a Savior. If there is no recognition of a sin, there is no need for repentance. And if there is no repentance, there is no salvation. So the first step to coming to Jesus and finding salvation in Him is we have to recognize that I need a Savior in the first place. 
Have you ever had those moments in your life where you realized, I'm not quite as good as I thought I was? I was a good kid growing up. I was, I was everyone's favorite. Everyone loved me. Why are you laughing? Maybe that's true. But I, was, I really was a pretty good kid. I didn't like getting in trouble. I got a lot of anxiety every time I got in trouble. One day, uh, my sister and I, uh, Pastor Kara, we were playing at the, at the Nederland Church, and we were playing with a kid across the street. And there were some huge dirt piles in between two of the buildings. And, and the three of us were just kind of playing, and somewhere along the way, we decided, hey, it'd be fun to throw rocks at each other. I don't know why this was a good idea. I don't know. Maybe I was angry at the kid. Maybe I blocked that out of my memory. I don't know. But I do remember this. I remember picking up a rock, and at this time I played a lot of baseballs. I had a pretty good arm, and uh, he cuts across from one, behind one pile to the second behind, pile. I throw a rock over there, hit him right in the head. Doosh, the kid goes down. The last memory I have of that kid ever was him going to the porch and his mom opening the door and him pointing his finger back at me like I threw, because I threw, like I threw, I did throw the rock at him. <laughs> and, and I never saw the kid again. I don't know, I don't know what happened to him. I don't know if he was scared to come to church, if he hates Christians for now and eternity because the pastor's kid hit him in the head with her. I don't know. All I know is this, like Sunday morning, I was the first one at the altar. Jesus, I'm a sinner. I hit the kid with a rock at the head. Uh, you ever have a moment like that where you realize you might need a savior? I, I, I still have them today. I, I know you think I'm perfect, but I'm, I'm really not. Um, just a few years ago, I was coaching softball, and I was over in, uh, in Needle, and it was an all-star, tur- all-star tournament. And uh, so I'm, I'm coaching the game, and, and the umpires were just terrible, and they were making all these bad calls, and I'm trying to convince the umpires in a very loving uh, Christian way. To get the calls right. And it's hot. It's, I mean, it feels like it's 120 degrees outside. This is like our fourth game of the day. It's the middle of the day. It is hot. And some guy from the other team is right on the other side of the dugout just a few feet from me. But he's behind two layers of fence. And he's yelling and shouting at me and talking trash about me. And finally, I just looked over there. And I had had enough. And I say to the guy, are you talking about me? And he's like, yeah, I'm talking about you. I said, then come out on this field and let's talk about it some more. I kid you not. It's in that moment, I, I'm at like the head, fl- well, not in that moment, maybe when I cool down, that I'm reading the headlines. Pastor gets himself beat up on a softball field with nine year old girls. <laughs> it was in that moment that I realized you know what? I still need a savior. I'm not as good as I thought I was. How many men would have said the same thing? I'm just, don't let me go down by myself right here. Yeah, I mean, c- come on out here and let's deal with it. I, you may beat the tar out of me. I, I will beat you down with my words, but my hands are not very strong. But I, look, my manhood was in question. The Lord is going to have to understand. There are times when we recognize in our life we make mistakes, we, make, we have problems, we do the wrong thing, and we realize, I still need a Savior. All of us need those moments where we realize our own guilt. This criminal said to the other criminal, we deserve to die for our crimes. Do we understand that according to the law, you and I, we all deserve An eternity in hell because of the decisions that we've made, the things that we have done wrong. And yet, here's the good news. When we recognize our guilt, when we recognize our need for a Savior, we can then turn to Jesus, who who his great desire is to save your soul. I read some questions this week. I'm going to get you to help me again. Uh, uh, Ray Comfort asked these questions and, and I want you to answer them with me, and I'm going to get you to raise your hand. How many of you have ever told a lie? Any lie. Any lie, big or little. Big or little at any point in your life. Okay. All right. Here's the deal. If you have lied, that means you are a liar. Um, how many of you have ever taken the Lord's name in vain? You know, you didn't mean to. A, a GD slipped out. Uh, y- y'all know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you know, I, I, look, look, I mean, keep your hands up high. Okay. 
Yeah, it's okay. Uh, we, you know, I just want, we're going to make sure we, we get some things out there today. Uh, that's called blasphemy. That's the very thing that, that thing that they accused Jesus of and he went to the cross for. But anyway, that's a... Um, how about this? How many of you have ever put something, be, something before God? Have you ever put something before God? you ever put something first in your life before God? Okay. Um, that's called idolatry. So you're an idolater. Don't raise your hand on this one. Just want you to give me like an eyebrow thing like this. Okay. Don't raise your hand. We don't want to know. Just, just give me an eyebrow. How many of you have ever looked at another man or another woman, respectively, uh, with lust in your heart? <laughs> These wives are like... <laughs> Just for the record, Jesus says, if you look on a woman with, a, with lust in your heart, you have already committed adultery. So we're all adulterers. So let's just get this straight. As good as you think you are, all of you 90s and 92s, let's just get this straight. You are a lying, thieving, adulterous idolater who takes the Lord's name in vain. And welcome to Triumph Church on this Easter Sunday morning. <laughs> You see, here is the reality. We are comparing ourselves to the wrong thing. For in the light of the standards of God's law, none of us are good. In fact, the Bible says there are none good, no, not one, other than God himself. So we think we're doing good, and yet none of us are good. All of us are in need of a Savior. James said it like this in James chapter 2, verse 10 in the New Living Translation. He said, for the person who keeps all of the laws except one is as guilty as the person who has broken all of God's laws. So you thought you were doing okay just because you only gave me an eyebrow raise. But you're as guilty as all of the rest of us. You break one. It's as if you've broken them all. We may not be sure that there is a God, but if there is one, we certainly want Him to help ease our suffering, heal our bodies, help us financially, save our marriage, give us a raise. But, but we need more than that. We need more than that. You see, the forgiven one asks for eternal help. It isn't just help me on this cross, help me ease my suffering. God wants, he'll do many of those things for you. He'll help you. He went to the cross for your healing. He went to the whipping post and took stripes on his back so that you could say, by his stripes, I am healed. But there's more to it than that. There is a bigger picture thing at play here. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He's asking for eternal help. Both thieves were guilty, both thieves were suffering, both thieves were dying, both needed a Savior, both saw and heard the same things during those last hours. But one was forgiven and one was not. One will spend eternity with Jesus and one will spend eternity with hell, in hell. You see, we come here today and we're all guilty and many of us are hurting and many of us are suffering and many of us are in need of a help but all of us are in need of a savior some will come in and some will say yes to Jesus help me come into my life be the lord of my life remember me in when you come into your kingdom but others will say no if you can help my life that would be great but i don't want or need a savior some will leave set free forgiven delivered saved others will check god in church off of their list until Christmas and leave no more saved than when you came in. One thief ha asked for help with the problems of this world, with his, with his suffering on the cross. The other asked for help with eternal things. Which thief are you? We have the same need and the same opportunity. One is transformed and one leaves the same. Which will you be? Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 3, verse 20. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. No one. You could try to keep the laws all day long, but you would, you would never be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply, and I want you to, show, I want you to see this, the law simply, simply shows us how sinful 